Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Diane Call. I have the pleasure and privilege of, of working at Queensborough Community College as the president, and I welcome you to our fall 2014 presidential lecture. Our series of the presidential lectures began in 2000, and it really was to create an environment to stimulate discussions on topics of the day. And in the fall, we bring a distinguished member of the CUNY faculty whose work uh, is important to all of us. And in the spring, we showcase one of our very own faculty. And we have a, an embarrassment of riches at Queensborough, for which I'm grateful. I want to thank my colleagues on the Presidential Lecture Committee, Dr. Karen Steele here, uh, Dr. Sasan Karimi, himself a presidential lecturer, Dr. Amy Traver, Dr. Mark Van Els. So I want to thank them for their work uh, to help bring this together. And tonight we welcome Dr. Chase Robinson, who is the president and distinguished professor of history at CUNY's Graduate Center. He's a much respected colleague among faculty, among provosts, among presidents. And that's because he's earned that through his tenure in each of these roles. Uh, he and I have had the privilege of working together as provost and as presidents. And he is a very impressive colleague and a very knowledgeable scholar. Dr. Robinson is considered the leading uh, scholar of early Islam of his generation. He holds a PhD from Harvard University's Department of Near Eastern Languages, <clears throat> excuse me, and Civilizations. And prior to joining CUNY, he was a professor of Islamic history at Oxford University in England and chaired its Faculty of Oriental Studies. Additionally, he was a member of the School of Historical Studies at Princeton University. Dr. Robinson, God bless you, <laughs> Dr. Robinson is the author or editor of seven books and more than 40 articles on his research topic. And he contributes commentaries in a variety of media, both in the United States and abroad. Dr. Robinson's journey in academia, which is grounded in the humanities, took an interesting turn when he explored early Islam in the Middle East. So many of us have been asked, what, will you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And, and so I'm very curious, as you must be, as to what influenced Dr. Robinson to pursue the study of early Islam history. So I'd like you to please give a warm welcome to Dr. Chase Robinson. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's a great pleasure to, um, to visit your campus and to, um, and to give you some sense of, of who I am and what I do. And before I begin, let me say a few words of thanks, of course, to President Call and, and, and also Dr. Steele and, and colleagues. It's a great honor and it's a privilege for me to be here. What I'd like to do is to um, is to begin with a dialogue, uh, which captures uh, my experience in the past, or at least what it used to be until fairly recently. And the dialogue will serve uh, the function of an introduction, and then I'll, I'll speak uh, briefly about the humanities and education, and then about Islam. So the dialogue that I'll begin with, slightly hypothetical, uh, ends with two questions. And it, in fact, is peppered with questions. But I'll, it ends with two, which I'll try to answer. What do you do? I used to be asked a lot. I teach. I'm a professor. Oh, what do you teach? History. I teach Middle Eastern history. Oh, I bet you have lots to say about the Middle East. Isn't it terrible what's happening there? What do you think we should do? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. You, you see, I'm actually a specialist in early Islamic history, the history of the 7th, the 8th, and the 9th centuries. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, how interesting. Um, 
are you or, or, or is your family? So that's the first of the two questions I'll try to answer. Now, of course, negative answers can be more interesting than positive answers sometimes. Since my family's history illustrates one of the themes that I'll be getting at today, which is education, and since it also throws light on my curious decision to become a scholar of Islam, allow me this autobiographical introduction. It can serve as an overture to what follows. My name might suggest otherwise, but I come from a family of polyglot immigrants, the one exception being my father's father, and hence my name. That grandfather was the son of a New Hampshire minister who, as it happens, did some teaching in Hebrew in 1899 to 1900, and perhaps also some Greek. The family history is a little bit vague. But aside from my grandfather, everyone else is at least figuratively a New Yorker. What do I mean by figuratively? Well, my dad's mother was born in Bergen, not Bergen, New Jersey, but Bergen on the western coast of Norway. She came to the States at the age of eight when her father, apparently tired after having worked for 20 years as a seaman, settled in Boston. She grew up, therefore, in a Norwegian-speaking household, first in East Boston and later on a farm in Concord, Massachusetts. She had several siblings, two of whom died of scarlet fever, we recently discovered. And at least according to the story, this was a scarlet fever that my grandmother had brought home from school. At least to her thinking, as revealed only very late in her life, the cost of her studies was her two brothers' lives. Be this as it may, there is no doubt that she was a good student, and so it was in nursing school that she met my grandfather, a doctor in training. Soon after marrying, they set off for China, where they lived from 1925 to 1941, among the last generations of missionary doctors who had begun living and working in China in the early 19th century. The rise of Chinese nationalism and war spelled the decline of missionary activity, and as it happens, my grandfather was caught up in the Japanese invasion, spending two years in a prisoner of war camp in the Philippines. My father was therefore born in China, and he was six when he first set foot in the States, arriving here in New York with his mother and three siblings, having crossed a continent and an ocean by train and by steamship. He was, I suppose, in a sense, both native and immigrant. And the timing of his arrival at the age of six meant that he lost his rudimentary Chinese, much to his regret later in life. But I still have dim but powerful memories of my grandmother, who uh, was a woman who thought a lot about herself, and she liked to show off, and one thing she liked to show off was the ability of her, her, her ability to, to speak Chinese. And I remember on more than one occasion being at Japanese restaurants, or at least one around the corner from where I grew up, in which she took the waiter to task for noting that the wallpaper had been mounted upside down. The characters didn't read correctly. What about my mother? My mother still speaks Ukrainian. Why does she speak Ukrainian? Although it's a bit rusty. Her mother um, had been born to a Ukrainian family already settled in Rhode Island, but her father was from a Ukrainian village in what is now Croatia. He came to the States in 1930, having sold the family horse to purchase his way out of army conscription. For two years, he lived in the Lower East Side amongst ethnic Ukrainians and Jews from Galicia, working first for a furrier and then in a delicatessen. While my father's father went to Harvard Medical School, neither my grandmother nor my grandfather on my mother's side had much of an education at all. My grandmother was smart, but in those days, especially in still industrial Rhode Island, smart girls often went straight from primary school into the textile mills. And that's what she did. Her future lay in the home in an arranged marriage. 
That marriage to a man who'd only recently arrived from Croatia was engineered by an aunt, an aunt who lorded over that part of the family, dispensing favors and even a bit of money. Rumor has it that she'd made that money, at least in part, by selling black market booze during the prohibition. This was the capital that allowed my grandfather to buy a gas station, which he ran for many years, doing business with local Ukrainians and servicing the three or four trucks that belonged to the Finkelstein woolen mill. He spoke broken English, in part because he could rely upon his wife and his children to speak for him, and in part because he didn't need to speak much English given the network, the circles in which he operated. So at this point, you're wondering why all of this detail, how indulgent of me, how narcissistic even, not meant to be that way at all. As a historian, I find this kind of social history interesting. But what does the history tell us? I think one thing is fairly obvious. My family is utterly unexceptional in illustrating the power of education. My mother was the first in her family to go to college. The second point becomes clear if I then pose the second question from my dialogue. How then, since I've explained myself, did you get into Islamic history? There is not a drop of Arab or Muslim blood, at least so far as I know, in my family. My identity is one thing, my background is one thing, and my academic interests are something else. Now, what there was in my family was a strong sense of a world beyond the suburbs of Boston where I grew up, not just a world of Slavic and Chinese cultures and languages, but also French, which my mother taught in the local high school. And since I also inherited my father's interest in history, Islamic history, was a natural confluence of, on the one hand, the study of Arabic, a difficult but terribly interesting language, which I suppose I chose to differentiate myself from my parents, and history. Now I say that mindful of the fact that any piecing together, in hindsight, of the circumstances, the accidents, motives, and interests that determines one's career is bound to reflect current thinking. In my case, as a scholar, as a teacher, as a former provost, and as a current president. In other words, it's an exercise in what I would call bad history, in allowing the perspective of the present to determine the shape of the past. The dialogue that I've transcribed does more, I think, than invite the creative variability of memory. Beyond my own experience, it's significant, I think, that I've never come up with an answer that addresses my interlocutor's incredulity without oversimplifying or trivializing or even aggrandizing my field. Unlike being a lawyer, a social worker, a teacher, a doctor, unlike, for that matter, being a biologist or even a historian of Europe or the United States, being a scholar of Islam is not an obvious thing to do. It's odd. It requires explanation. And I think this is the case for two reasons. The first is the state of teaching and research in the humanities. And by that, I mean both its reality and its perception. Why study the humanities in the 20th and the 21st century? The second is the specific humanistic inquiry that, I presume, that I've pursued, that strange, exotic, and it must be said, sometimes at least to some people, that disconcerting, that discomforting, even sinister thing called Islam. Now, I think there is a distinctly American inflection to both of these questions in the often baffled reaction to the idea that one may reasonably devote oneself to learning for something like learning's sake, and second, to the idea that Islam should be the subject of proper study. In other words, 
If it's not obvious that one should devote oneself to a career in the humanities, it is especially unobvious that someone should take an interest in the history made by Muslim Arabs 1,400 years ago, perhaps especially someone with my background. So let me try to flesh out, um, at least provisionally, a good answer to the conversations that I have, conversations that never allow me to make that proper response. I'd also like to take the opportunity to reflect a little bit, make some broader observations about the humanities and my own field. So let me start um, by speaking uh, briefly about the humanities and education, and then I'll turn to Islamic history. Now, here at Queensborough, we find ourselves at a wonderful institution of education and learning, which is part of the extraordinary system of institutions that is CUNY, in aggregate, as you will know, the single most powerful engine of opportunity in arguably the world's most cosmopolitan and cultured of cities. It may not always feel that way, but we are deeply privileged. That said, our position in a college, within a university, within a rich and diverse city, well, our experience is atypical. The fact is we live in a society that has always been ambivalent about the status of ideas. The common strain that binds together the attitudes and ideas, which I shall call anti-intellectualism, as Richard Hofstetter wrote in 1963, is a resentment and a suspicion of the life of the mind and those who are considered to represent it, and a disposition constantly to minimize the value of that life. The so-called dumbing down of America, so regularly chronicled on both the left and the right, may or may not be a symptom of this anti-intellectualism so famously chronicled by Hofstetter. And anti-intellectualism is scarcely unique to American political culture. In fact, it's even taken the form of near genocidal violence elsewhere, such as in China's Cultural Revolution and the Iranian Revolution. But I would venture to suggest that American culture is distinctive in its full embrace of anti-intellectualism, almost as civic virtue, especially given the role of an intellectual vanguard in our own revolutionary origins. The promise of equality was certainly left unfulfilled in the 18th century, but there is no doubting how radical its thinking was nor that ideas propelled social change, as Gordon Wood has written so masterfully in The Radicalism of the American Revolution. Now here, let me draw an obvious but important distinction between education on the one hand and research on the other, especially research of a theoretical and unapplied bent. Now, on the one hand, there is nothing more American, I think, than a faith in the transformative power of education. Education both of the individual and also, I think, at least from the late 19th century, of society through industrialization principally, industrialization driven by the rational deployment of skilled workers. We take this faith for granted. This faith underpins our hopes and it underpins our fears. And these days, I think you'll all agree with me that the fears dominate. Due in large part to the opening up of markets that we associate with globalization, anxiety about the quality of American education has become endemic and the calls for reform perennial. We're losing the global race of competitiveness, we're told. And, and I may sound a bit like a crank here, bear with me, in a society that fetishes technology and that elides quantification, satisfaction, and quality, 
a society of crowdsourced Wikipedia truths, Amazon bestsellers, and constant connectivity, it should not surprise that this anxiety generates rankings, it generates indices, common cores amenable to assessment, virtual classrooms, and the like. Now, leaving aside the open question of how much of this is actually efficacious, and don't get me wrong, I think that many of our practices and institutions need to be challenged, I hope that we can all agree that mass education is a crucial component in our American project of market capitalism and, given some recent Supreme Court rulings, what might be called market democracy. On the other hand, there is nothing more American, I think, than a deep skepticism that education should do more than inculcate skills, transmit knowledge, or teach virtue. That is, that ideas, even those ideas that have no apparent or applied value, can possess not merely an intrinsic quality, such that libraries or archives or museums should preserve them, but also a transformative power, such that universities should foster and generate them. Now, it's precisely this idea it's precisely because this idea, the one that I've just mentioned, that this idea is imperiled that we have books such as Jonathan Cole's The Great American University. It's a book that catalogs the insights, inventions, and theories that took root in research universities. The book is a tour de force. It's an exhaustive and impassioned case for research, which continues to be made, I should note, in an ongoing website called universitydiscovery.com. But framed by a model of discovery or invention or innovation, Cole's discussion is predictably dominated by the sciences, by engineering, and by the social sciences. It's called comfort to the humanist. And in this sense, it's not critique, but more apologetic. For it takes for granted the now dominant paradigm facilitated by both public and private funding mechanisms that instrumentalizes universities for short and middle term purposes. When the governor of Florida opined that we could do, we could do without more anthropologists, or when President Obama himself questioned the utility of a degree in art history, I hate to say this, but I don't think they were saying anything new at all. In fact, they were doing what politicians do as a matter of course. They were expressing their own voice, observations that have been pre-rinsed, if I may, in the cycle of public opinion. Now, it's true that a contrite President Obama followed up his faux pas by contacting at least one aggrieved art historian, writing here that, quote, Art history was one of my favorite subjects in high school, and it has helped me take a great deal of joy in my life that I might otherwise have missed. But this, it seems to me, in fact, reinforces his original point. Art history is a luxury pursuit that fosters surplus joy. The fact is, ours is a culture that rewards the production of applied knowledge far more than it does the preservation, analysis, or critique of culture, be it normative or otherwise. Consider the economics of education. Federal funding for education has increased enormously since Hofstadter's day. But the rivers of cash have been guided by the most purposeful and pragmatic of policies investment in science and technology in the service of the Cold War, or the battle for economic competitiveness. The National Institutes for Health currently receive about $32 billion a year annually, and the National Science Foundation about $7 billion annually. Now, relative to other federal outlays, take for example the 
$2 trillion or so that was spent on the war in Iraq, those sums are admittedly a pittance. Now, I want to be very clear. Our scientists deserve more money, not less. But if those sums are a pittance, how is one to describe the funding received by the National Endowment for the Humanities? It's about the cost of one F-22 Raptor airplane, as the head of the Mellon Foundation put it. The budget of the National Endowment for the Humanities, $150 million a year, is just short of 0.5% of that of the National Endowments, uh, National Institutes for Health. Not 5%, 0.5%. It is, I think, little wonder that about 8% nationally of undergraduates now major in the humanities, 8%. The unemployed English major is a favorite trope in popular culture. In fact, even within the academy, the system of rewards could not be clearer. One study has shown that over the last 20 years, the premium paid to assistant professors in economics over their counterparts in English has grown from 124.8 to 151.4. But it's not just that academic economists are paid about 50% more than English professors. A career teaching in one of the social sciences or humanities, it must be said, is manifestly impractical. It requires long training, and it holds dim prospects for long-term peace of mind. Six or eight or 10 years for the PhD, a year or two or three or four, perhaps, to land a tenure track job, and another six or seven years before one receives tenure, that is, if one receives it, having landed one of those precious tenure track jobs. Nationally, less than 30% of all teaching positions are held by those who are tenured or on the tenure track, less than 30%. So that's the context of the humanities and social sciences. Let me turn now to Islam and hone in on my own curious career trajectory. Now, if embarking upon a career in the humanities means doing something unobvious, doing Islamic history is positively mystifying. I turn from the generality that is theoretical and humanistic inquiry to the specific. Let me start with a reception that I received as a professor of Islamic history. This mystifying idea. How do I answer it? Having spent 15 years living and teaching in the United Kingdom, I am convinced that this reception, this incredulity that I described earlier, is best understood by drawing a contrast with Europe. The argument that I'm going to outline is that in contrast to Europe, Islam remains relatively foreign in the United States, both as lived experience and object of academic study. Some numbers. According to the best ep uh, estimates, there are now about 1.6 billion Muslims, 23% of the world's total population of roughly 7.1 or 7.2 billion people. So 1.6 billion Muslims. Currently, about a billion Muslims live in the Asia Pacific region, 320 million in the Middle East, 240 million in Sub Saharan Africa, 43 million in Europe, an increase of 13 million over the last 20 years, and only about 5 million in both North and South America. Now, much could be said about these numbers, but I'll limit myself to those regarding Europe, particularly as they contrast with those here in the States. Expressed in percentages of regional population, Europe is about 10 times more Muslim than are the Americas. Muslims constitute about 6% of the population of Europe, about 0.6% of the population of the Americas. Put another way, Muslims are a greater percentage of the European population than are Asian Americans here in the States. The US is the world's mo third most populous country, as I'm sure you know. 
but its Muslim population is only about 0.5% of the world's total. So I think population and population growth, particularly the last 20 years in Europe, can explain the salience of Muslims in the political and cultural imagination in Europe, European thinking more generally. But that's only part of the explanation. The explanation is not just demography, but it's also history. Political, cultural, and intellectual interaction between Europe and the Islamic Middle East has been more or less constant from the start, facilitated by continuous geography and the relative ease of communication and transport across the Mediterranean. We tend to draw imaginary lines across the globe, dividing peoples and polities into civilizations. But no such lines have ever existed. The norm was more or less constant interchange, exchange and cross-pollination across lands and regions. What is understood to be the colonial encounter of the 19th and 20th centuries was, I think, only the last and the most intensive period in interaction between the adjacent regions of West Asia that we call Europe and the Middle East. Indulge me a little bit of my own area of expertise. Now, as you will know, Islam has its origin in the late 6th century. And in 622, Muhammad, the prophet, he made his emigration from the town of Mecca to Medina, where he died in 632. What you may not know is that by no later than the 650s, an anonymous chronicler writing in Latin in what is now Burgundy in central France, already by the 650s he had transmitted an account of wars taking place between the Saracens, that is to say the Muslim Arabs, and Byzantine armies. The account presumably came through Byzantine Italy. Now the report itself is fantastic. It speaks of 150,000 people dying, which is impossible given the size of seven century armies. But what it does accurately convey is the anxiety and the hostility that characterize Christian responses to Islam, and which would be a more or less constant feature throughout the pre-modern period. Given that much of the expansion of Islam came at the expense of Christendom, indeed, given that Muslims claim to supersede a monotheist tradition, that had begun with the Jews and continued with Christians, I think we can agree that this anxiety and hostility, they're not hard to understand. Indeed, they're quite understandable. Oversimplifying, one can say that these Christian attitudes, which were never monolithically hostile, they tended to ease as Christian kingdoms rolled back Islamic territories starting in the 12th and 13th centuries. In this period, one finds something quite different. One finds that Christians had things to learn from Muslims. Compared to Northern and Western Europe, the Islamic Middle East was rich in resources and rich in knowledge. And so Renaissance and Enlightenment thinkers naturally owed a great deal to Islamic cultural and intellectual traditions. This is why radical Enlightenment thinkers, as Jonathan Israel has shown, they admired Islam's rationality. Historians of early modern science, to give you another example, have argued that the Copernican revolution itself owes a great deal to Islamic astronomy and mathematics. The first chairs of Arabic were established in Cambridge and Oxford in the 17th century, because in the 17th century, Arabic alongside Latin was the preeminent language of culture. John Locke, if there ever was an Enlightenment humanist, John Locke himself studied Arabic at Oxford. So, Christian attitudes towards Islam may have been hostile, they may have been uninformed, they may have been admiring, but they were the product, and here's my point, they were the product of sustained contact. Colonialism deepened the European commitment to learning about Islam 
but it doesn't explain it. All of this stands in fairly stark contrast with the United States, where the study of the Middle East and Islam took firm root only in the context of the Cold War, as European scholars, mainly British and German, came to the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s. My own doctoral supervisor belonged to the first real generation of American historians of Islam. His doctoral supervisor was a Scottish scholar born in Alexandria, Egypt in, get this, 1895. Strange as it sounds even to my own ears, in that sense, I am the grandson of British colonialism. Now, what I've done is to give a couple reasons why Islam is relatively foreign to American life and scholarship, but I certainly haven't addressed the question of why Islamic history is worth studying. Let me close by answering the question. Now, what I will not argue is that the liberal arts or the humanities in general foster critical thinking, that they foster uh, the ability to communicate well, and other skills that may be deemed transferable to the working place. This and much more besides, they certainly do. And when I teach Islamic history, I emphasize those very skills. But so should any discipline in any college education. The social sciences and the sciences do it or can do it just as well. Second, as much as I believe that there is a sure connection, nor will I speak about education and democracy. Again, for the same reason. Taught well, the social sciences teach the same skills the same ability to participate in democratic life than the humanities do. I say this as a humanist. What I'd like to do is to focus on history. More narrowly, I'd like to answer the question that I put in such a way as to explain how the study of any pre-modern history has things to teach us. In other words, I'm returning to the theme with which I began. I'll make only two arguments although I think several more can be made. The first argument I'll call the Faulkner argument. I call it the Faulkner argument because it's grounded in the off-quoted line from William Faulkner's Requiem for a Nun. The past is never dead, it is not even past. Now, precisely what Faulkner had in mind, I will leave to Faulknerists. But what I mean is this. The present is constituted of the past, both real, that is, as a chain of causalities that led to the now, but also imagined, that is, our individual or collective back projections, some fantastic, some reasonable, back projections that narrate in culturally valorized ways who we are and what we do. Now, when I spoke a moment ago about civilization and the Enlightenment, I was already hinting at one example. We live in a West, but that West is, at least in part, an imaginary construction. We live in a West that, as a matter of history, that is, stubborn, documentable facts, cannot be explained genealogically as the linear descendant of classical Athens or Rome or Renaissance and Enlightenment Europe. Our history is much more interesting than that. But I won't explore that example. The example that I will explore is, very briefly, the religious, political, and military movement with which we are all regrettably familiar and which goes by the name, variously, of ISIS, or ISIL, or IS, or SIC, or Daesh. It seems to change once a week. 
Now, any reasonable explanation for its spectacular success must begin in what, what, in what we might call current or ongoing events and processes. The civil war in Syria and the failed state that is post-invasion Iraq, both of which dislocated and dissolved social, political, and military institutions and so inflamed sectarian strife. Civil society being so weak in Syria and Iraq, civil society being so weak, when state institutions collapsed, populations balkanized. Meanwhile, security apparatuses and militaries that had been employed to maintain authoritarian and minority rule, those fell apart, flooding society with skilled commanders and also soldiers prepared to fight along those balkanized sectarian lines. But that narrative, or that reconstruction, it begs a number of questions. Why were the states so brittle? Why have the fissures taken place along sectarian rather than, say, class lines? Those are good questions. I won't answer them. But why, indeed, has Islam supplied the ideo ideological language of violence? It is striking to an early Islamic historian that the leader of ISIS, a man called Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he calls himself a caliph, a term that originally appearing in the Quran means delegate of God, and which came to be used to describe the ruling institu institution of the great empires of early Islam in the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th century. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's use of this term caliph is just one example of an archaic language of symbols and institutions that ISIS fosters. The most recent example that comes to mind of this quite deliberate um, employment of archaic symbols and languages is their announcement just two or three days ago that they would be minting their own coinage. This is what caliphs did in the 7th, 8th, and ninth century. They minted their own coinage, which was distinct from Byzantine or Sasanian, that is to say Persian coinage. And they did that not only to address economic questions, to foster exchange, but also to constitute themselves as culturally distinct from Christian and non-Muslim empires. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is doing the same thing. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and the Islamists of his ilk, they possess a history of their own imagination. A history, as Muslims will tell you, which consecrates violence, demonizes Shiites, and posits a glorious pre-colonial past of Sunni unity. Part of my job as a historian of early Islam, and this is what I encourage my colleagues who teach the same and research the same, is to communicate how aberrant, how curious, in some respects how perverse, that imaginary history is. No purely economic or geopolitical analysis of ISIS can account for the rhetoric of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and his ilk, or the underlying ideology of ISIS. You need history to do that. So that's the Faulkner argument, or at least what I'm calling the Faulkner argument. The second argument I'll make for pre-modern history I'll call the Hartley argument. It too is grounded in a line from fiction, L.P. Hartley's The Go-Between, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Well, they do and they don't. And in the discerning of where they do and where they don't is where the good historian's exercise of imagination, both sympathetic and skeptical, can be found to operate. On the one hand, 
when I think about the 7th, 8th, and 9th century, I am reminded of what a different place it is. Individual and society in early Islam could not be more foreign from ours. Kinship groups, families, households, clans, tribes, these were far more powerful than in our highly individuated world. The push of the new, and there was a push of the new, the push of the new was braked by the pull of the old. Technological change being, as a rule, very, very slow. The Book of Nature, if I may, had not yet been written in Renaissance and early modern mathematics. And metaphysics, magic and religion and more, intruded into the physical world as a matter of course. And yet, and yet, despite these and other differences, individual and society are in some sense kindred to us. To understand Islamic history is to recognize the perennial and I think irreducibly human attempt to align governance with political ideals. To balance loyalties to family or friends with ambitions for economic gain or social advancement and to make sense intellectually and morally of the world's competing pressures. The emotional life of an 8th century Muslim is recognizable, sometimes even astoundingly so. A favorite anecdote of mine comes from a 9th century book of history, and it recounts in comedic detail the disappointment felt by a commander when a subordinate stupidity got the best of him. What is the gesture that this ninth century book of history narrates? What is the gesture that signals this commander's astonishment? It's ours, the hand to the forehead. He goes just like this when his subordinate acts so stupidly. At least until recently, human culture was grounded in space the particularities of difference being counterbalanced by the common and necessarily collective venture that comes with inhabiting, with cultivating, and organizing that ground and space. This is true of Muslims, it's true of Christians, it's true of Jews, it's true of also Norwegians and Ukrainians. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very wonderful and interesting talk, Dr. Robinson. May I introduce myself as Professor Emerita Zinberg of Queensborough Community College. Um, <clears throat> my question is of, uh, about Mohammed's uh, behaviors and uh, attitudes toward the Jews in 7th century. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, who, Muhammad? Muhammad, right. yes. What was the historic, uh, what were the historic facts of what happened in the 7th century during Muhammad's uh, prime rule? You, you put your finger on an enormously interesting and difficult question. Yes. Let me begin to explain why it's difficult. Um, and then I'll turn to why it's so interesting. The reason it's so difficult is that, um, for the most part, we do not know. And the reason we do not know is that narratives of Muhammad's life and conduct, his attitudes towards the Jews or Christians for that matter, what he did, what he ordered his subordinates to do, those are all narrated in books of history that post-date the events by no less than a century and a half, two centuries, three centuries, sometimes even four centuries. So what we have in representations of Muhammad 
is not first-person testimony, not the kind of good, solid evidence that you and I would wish to work with, but rather much later representations of generations that postdated Muhammad's life by six, seven, eight, nine, ten generations. So what they describe is their own world. In other words, what sources present as description is often prescription. Right. So let me tell you what they prescribe. And it is ambivalent and confused. On the one hand, one can discern from the Quran, which is an exception to the representation I just gave you of the state of the evidence, because the Quran is thought to be contemporaneous with Muhammad. On the one hand, one can discern in the, in the Quran an attitude on the part of Muhammad, if we assume that it reflects Muhammad's attitude, that is more favorable to, towards the Jews than it is towards the Christians. Mm -hmm. He was operating an environment which was particularly an imperial regional environment in which Christianity is institutionalized in the Byzantine Empire. That was the foe. There is, moreover, some suggestions in some of the evidence that early on he had cordial relations with Jews. The tradition then describes, usually dated to the middle of the 620s, a break with the Jews that resulted in an expulsion, a massacre, and outright hostilities. Yeah. Do you know what the reason for that was? Sorry? Do you know what the reason for that was? The uh, break? Insofar as the sources uh, provide a single reason, it would be that they were disloyal. He was building a community a community in which he was trying to attract the support of Christians and Jews, other monotheists, and they quite reasonably resisted that. Um, to say much more beyond that is to go to a level of detail in which anecdote, a problematic anecdote, uh, doesn't support the weight of much argument. OK, may I um, relate what I have learned about it. Uh, I'm not a great scholar, as are you, of uh, early Islamic history, but what I was taught that the um, economics had a lot to do with it, and the Jews had established a trade, a very uh, lucrative trade, uh, before Mohammed, and uh, he wanted uh, that trade and therefore chased uh, the Jews out so that uh, his society could enjoy the benefits of, of uh, the trade that had been established. True or false? Uh, <laughs> highly unlikely. The reason it's highly unlikely is that if, if a discussion such as the one that we're having is predicated in the idea that there's enough evidence for us to reach some general, perhaps even some particular conclusions about Muhammad. With that assumption in mind, everything that Muhammad was was extremely practical and pragmatic. The last thing he would have done is massacre Jews just for economic reasons of commanding a train. Not massacre, uh, but cause them to flee the country. I, I think it's unlikely, uh, which is not to say that he might not have had uh, designs on increasing trade that would come under his control. That is certainly, uh, certainly has verisimilitude. Well, it's uh, logical. And I was, I was uh, taught this by a learned Islamic scholar, so uh, I know that there are revisions, revisionists in the field of history, <laughs> and I decry them, but um, uh, it makes sense to me that the, um, that the economic reasons would be strong. Thank you. I, uh, I I, I, as I like to say, I stand on the shoulders of giants, and I like to be kicked in the head sometimes. <laughs> Professor, uh, I've heard many uh, expert scholars in, in uh, Islam speak, and I've always asked them the question concerning Tahimi. They start with a general explanation of what Tahimi means, and then they cut it in the middle, and you never get the full explanation. Do you know 
uh, I, I, why that is, uh, uh, it's a very important word. It, it describes a way of thinking and a potential for Christians and Jews. So why is not the whole definition offered to the public, and why is half of it hidden all the time? Uh, you're inquiring about the term vimmi. Dehimi. Dehimi. D a d, d apostrophe i h h yeah, m i m m i. If I'm understanding you correctly, uh, the term, uh, the Arabic term is vimmi, which means protected person. Correct. Um, it's and, half of it. And that is a term which was given to, to, to use principally Muslims and Christians who lived within the Dadal Islam, within Islamic society. Christian Correct. Jews. The other half of the definition is that the Jews and the Christians would live like they would under the Nuremberg laws in Germany. They would have all their personal, pardon me, they would, this better? This better? <laughs> they would, they would uh, have all the uh, limitations of uh, a civil life. Couldn't go to school, couldn't get advancement, couldn't do many things as you couldn't with the Nuremberg laws. And yet no one mentions the implications on one's per personal life. They only talk about protection. Pointed in the field of uh, Islamic study. It's not mentioned. Um, you can read my work and, I'll talk, and I can show you where I talk about it. And I talk about it not because I'm unique in the field of Islamic history, but because you're absolutely right to give a partial answer is, uh, is the source of disappointment. So let me just, as it were, um, parse the term a little bit. I'll try to be brief. The concept itself is rooted in the idea of protection, but you're perfectly right that Jews and Christians, non-Muslims in general, even those who were monotheists, were not entitled to the same rights and privileges of Muslims. The clearest example of that is the imposition of what's called a head tax, a capitation tax, which was levied upon Christians and Jews and non-Muslims. Having said that, it was also the case that religion was an important variable in social advancement and in inclusion, what we would call now, nowadays. But language, in some respects, was more. So if you were an ambitious Christian or ambitious Jew, if you learned Arabic, there were all sorts of prospects for employment. Now, I'm not going to suggest that 7th or 8th century Arabia was uh, like Luxembourg in the 21st century. Um, the point is not that 7th or 8th century Arabia was some Disneyland of ecumenical bliss. It is rather that there were regulations in place which, and here I don't want to be confused as an apologist because I'm certainly not, which compare well to the contemporaneous situation in other societies. But that's not my main point. My main point is to agree with you that the concept of protection is only part of the, of the compact. Thank you. My other question is important. Uh, the Arab Spring. A few years ago, we've never heard of the term. Historians didn't know the term. And I had great admiration for the um, Muslim Brotherhood. It looked like they were going to give an injection to the entire concept. And all of a sudden, Egypt had an elected government, and the Egyptians were wise enough to overthrow an elected Muslim Brotherhood government because they couldn't tolerate the Muslim Brotherhood. Could historians foresee this? Uh, I think the answer is no, we didn't. Right. Yes, uh, Peter Bales, History Department. Thank, thank you for being here. Terrific presentation. When it comes to Islam, I think it's fair to say that we Americans don't understand them very well, and they don't understand us very well. Do you see any scenario, do you have any hope that this will change in the near future? And what can those of us who work at a community college or go to a community college do to help? 
That's a terrific question. And um, I am so gratified to hear that question posed. Um, let me um, speak to just one small part of it. And let me say something which is controversial in some circles and I think uh, utterly uncontroversial in other circles. But I'll say it because it speaks to this question of communication. Uh, I am opposed to the BDS movement, the boycott divestment uh, movement, precisely because it inhibits the kind of communication that needs to take place. It inhibits the ability of Israeli scholars to come to the United States and to build relationships with Israeli institutions. So that is part of my answer. What can we do? The chancellor himself this morning spoke to this issue that perhaps we are the victims of our own diversity here at the City University of New York, precisely because something in the order of 46 or 48 percent of our students come from homes in which a language other than English is spoken, precisely because there are 190 languages spoken across the campuses, precisely because first and second, second generation success is such an important part of who we are, we haven't globalized in the way that we should have. So what, are all, what, what, what kind of connections do we have with foreign universities such that we have not just the glory that is New York's diversity in our classrooms, but also, to take your question, Muslims. Now, I think we do have to be careful about dividing the world into we and them. Uh, one of the points that I, that I might have made about that census information, it's interesting just how few Muslims or live in the Middle East. The vast majority of Muslims live in, in South Asia, Indonesia, um, uh, uh, about a billion live in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so I think, you know, if one thinks anthropologically, the question is, how do we navigate the, uh, the dichotomy of Islam and the West? in a way that's culturally sensitive. It means one thing to engage Muslims in the Middle East, something very different because the populations are so different, Muslims of Sub-Saharan Africa. One of, the, one of the very interesting processes that's unfolding before our eyes is the emergence, the articulation of a distinctly European Islam. It puts many Europeans ill at ease to think that Muslims, Muslim populations are growing as fast as they are and that there will be this distinct thing called a European Islam. But thank you for your question. Okay. Make the question. Well, I think, oh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, think I have a couple of questions that I'd like to pose to you. We're going to get like the mic. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions that I'd like to pose. And I'd like to come back to early Islamic history. Uh, I'm under the impression that if one reads the Quran chronologically, according to the composition, one finds a theme of more toleration toward other religions in the early verses. And apparently, as Muhammad strengthens his position, over the years, the later revelations become less and less tolerant of others. Uh, I, I take that as part of a political military stratagem. Am I correct in, in what I'm saying so far? I would say that very accurately. Um, captures the consensus of traditional scholarship, which says, if one takes the Quranic text and works out a chronology, a very difficult thing, that's why I'm speaking so carefully, that those verses that would appear later in that chronological schema reflect his circumstances, building a Muslim community in Medina, unlike the earlier verses, which reflect his attempt to missionize, proselytize while he was in Mecca. So you're, 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 that is correct. 
Now, the, one of the problems I understand with that is that later verses in Islamic uh, philosophy or theology, however you want to phrase it, are understood to replace earlier phrases. Hmm. So that when one is having a discussion about the qualities of peacefulness of Islam and makes references to the Quran, we can't find these early verses, which are very, shall I say, touchy-feely. And the problem is that the later verses are the ones that are more authentic in that they are the ones that are considered to be replacements, in a sense, for the earlier verses. So I, I have found, I've done some Quranic studies. I can tell. And I have found it rather depressing in terms of how do we understand modern Muslim thought and how Muslims understand the Quran. And that brings us to uh, the second question that I have. And this concerns the contemporary use of concepts that go back to the 8th and 9th century. The Charter of Hamas makes very clear that their understanding of the world is that any part of the world, particularly Israel right now, but presumably it extends to other parts of the world, that had one time been under Islamic dominion and under Sharia law, has to be the, the present governance of those areas have to be replaced according to Islamic law as the charter of Hamas understands it and as it refers back to the Quran in explaining it. Right. Can you comment on that? Uh, um, I'd be happy to. Um, and my response will be incomplete. Um, a moment ago I mentioned that there is this exciting process taking place, which is the articulation of a distinctly European kind of Islam. That is to say, the view articulated by progressive Muslims that one can lead a completely full and fulfilling Muslim life in complete conformity to the ethics and expectations of Islamic law while living in a non-Muslim country, be it France or Germany or Italy or anywhere else, or the United States for that matter. That is a view amongst, that is a very important view. It's a very, it's an extraordinarily rich and important argument that's developing. Hamas, has a radically different construction of what Islamic belief is. They hold to a construction, which we tend to call fundamentalist, or a historian of religion or a sociologist might call a maximalist, which emphasizes the public manifestation of Islam and says that full Islamic life must be institutionalized in a state. And moreover, the state must recapture land lost. It's not a view that commands the, the, the vast majority of Muslim thinking, uh, but it is a view which, for reasons that we probably can't get into, has a fair amount, a regrettably large amount, of popularity in the Middle East right now. Well, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to thank Dr. Robinson for a very interesting afternoon. And please help you join us for light refreshments outside, and we'll be sending you information about our spring faculty.